Thanks for joining us. I'm John Mather, Senior Project Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. I look forward to talking with you about the science of Webb. The Webb Telescope was conceived to go way beyond the science of Hubble with a far bigger mirror to collect more light, to give sharper images, and to see farther. It's an infrared telescope to see at wavelengths where the Hubble cannot see. It's the result of an international collaboration of scientists and engineers working to see beyond what the Hubble can see with the most ambitious telescope we could actually build. As we're getting close to launch, I will show you what astronomers are planning to look at and what we're hoping to find. The real prize will be a surprise, something nobody was expecting. So in the next show, so in the next chart, I show you that Webb telescope helps us look back in time to see the first stars and galaxies. Uh, every time you look at something far away, you are looking back in time to see things as they were when the light was sent out to you not as they are at this very moment. So if we look at things far enough away, we can see almost all the way back to what astronomers call the Big Bang. Uh, we have known the universe is expanding since 1929 when Edwin Hubble who is the first graph that shows the distance of the galaxies versus the velocities. And we knew that the universe had an age for the first time. Uh, I played my own part in this history. You see my little picture in the upper right with a, my graph of the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the heat that is left over from those earliest moments and we measured it very well with the Cosmic Background Explorer and I uh, got to go off to Stockholm and uh, get a nice little present from the King of Sweden. At any rate, we now are pretty sure that all of the events on this schematic picture did occur. Uh, the ones that are close by, we have lots of evidence. The ones that are far back in time, uh, we are still a bit mystified because it's really hard to see anything. So what, one of the reasons why we want to build a new telescope is to see uh, the thing that's shown as first stars and galaxies, way over on the right-hand side of this picture. Uh, we think that in the beginning, uh, there were only hot gases uh, cooling down after the Big Bang, uh, but then um, after some period of time, a little bit unknown, um, the first galaxies and stars were able to be formed probably by gravity pulling uh, material together and reversing the expansion of the material. So we'd like to see those. Those would be the first things that we could possibly see. Uh, so we designed the Webb telescope specially so we'd be able to look that far back in time to see those objects. Of course, we don't really know what they are, so we didn't know exactly what to design. So we built the most powerful telescope we could possibly imagine. Uh, by the way, this chart is labeled with uh, letters as Z. Z refers to what astronomers call redshift. This is the amount of increase of wavelength of light that is due to the expansion of the universe. We see things seeming to run away from us and that stretches out the light that they have from what was originally ultraviolet and visible light to the infrared light that we will observe with the Webb telescope. An important marker on this chart is the nine billion years old place where the sun is formed we believe that the uh, Milky Way galaxy was formed shortly after the Big Bang, but that the Sun is a new form. New. We believe that the Milky Way galaxy was formed shortly after the Big Bang, but the Sun was formed very recently, uh, after two thirds of the age of the universe had already passed. Uh, about nine billion years had passed, and the Sun is about 4.6 billion years old. So we would like to see everything on this chart uh, to learn about our own history. So in the next chart, I want to show you uh, how we began to learn about this from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we decided to, to point the Hubble Telescope in a direction where there was almost nothing to see. The one star that we knew about uh, that's shown in the lower right corner of this picture with the green and red spikes sticking out, and the rest of the objects in this picture are galaxies. Uh, we did not expect to see so many. And we did not expect that we would have such a hard time seeing the very first ones. Astronomers were very sure the galaxies formed slowly, uh, but we were wrong. Uh, this picture showed astronomers that when we look at the most distant galaxies, the little red specks in here um, that are red because of the expanding universe, that they were certainly already uh, growing rapidly uh, at the most distant ones that's Webb telescope at the most distant galaxies that the Hubble telescope could see. The Webb telescope will be able to see farther. And so astronomers wrote a little book and said, please build us another telescope that's much more powerful than the Hubble. It's capable of seeing the ones that are in this picture, but not in this picture.
because they're too faint and too far away and too red. So that's the telescope that we're building. On the next picture, I want to show you uh, one of the reasons that we use infrared besides the expanded universe. This picture shows you the difference in the appearance between the visible light picture and an infrared light picture taken with the Hubble telescope. On the left side, you see the visible light picture the uh, dust clouds that are so beautiful there are opaque. Uh, and the uh, ordinary visible light will bounce right off a dust grain. On the right hand side, you see that uh, the dust becomes transparent enough, uh, infrared wavelengths, and, you, and this is because the light waves are longer in, in size than the size of the dust grains and they go, go right around the dust. So we can see inside a dust cloud if the wavelengths of light are longer. That is to say, infrared. So they're one of the reasons that we're building the Webb telescope this way. Another reason, by the way, to study infrared light is that objects that are too cool to glow like the sun still emit lots of infrared light. So we now have three reasons to build an infrared telescope. One, to see the expanding universe redshifted objects. One, to see around the dust grains inside the clouds like this. And one, to see new objects that are too cool to be luminous themselves at the visible wavelengths that we picked up with our own eyes or that the Hubble telescope can pick up. On the next picture, I want to show you a movie of how the view changes as we extend the wavelength from visible light to infrared. So this movie uh, was taken with the Hubble telescope images uh, and it shows you this amazing and beautiful uh, cloud of gas changing its appearance from glowing and opaque to somewhat transparent and allowing us to see into the interior where stars are being born as we speak. One of the top topics of astronomers is how do the stars get born and how do they make planets? So in the next chart, I wanna show you uh, one of the things we hope to observe with um, Webb telescope in the solar system. Basically in the solar system, we can see every object from Mars on outwards we cannot see closer to the sun than that because otherwise the sun will shine onto the telescope. Uh, but here are two examples uh, of very interesting satellites in the solar system. Uh, the first one, Europa, is on the left and it is a satellite of Jupiter. Uh, we uh, know about this because Galileo himself discovered it in 1610. We sent a mission entitled Galileo to visit it and we took this picture and we know from the picture that uh, this little satellite has an ocean which is covered with ice and it has little warm water geysers where material is spitting out from the satellite and we are going back we are planning a mission to fly a probe through the the plumes of water coming out of those little geysers what would we know we would hope to find out if there's life or any signs of life in the chemical signature of the material coming out from those geysers eventually we might want to land there but uh, we'll start with a easier part of just flying through the plumes of the geysers. On the right hand side, we have a geological map of the surface of Titan. Titan is a satellite of Saturn. Um, and we know from visiting it and even landing a probe on the surface that it has clouds, it has hydrocarbon rain, that's methane and ethane. It has lakes and rivers and craters and dunes and weather. And there are rocks made out of ordinary water ice. And we're planning a trip to go back there too. Uh, we have in mind a thing called the Dragonfly, which will be a little quadcopter that can uh, pick up and travel across the surface uh, fairly far um, and uh, measure uh, the chemicals that are there and look for signs of life, or at least signs of geology that would tell us about the signs of life way out there on this satellite of Saturn. This is the first place and perhaps the only place we have a chance of finding out whether life can form without requiring the liquid water and the, uh, and the temperature domain that we're familiar with here on Earth. So a fascinating possibility. And of course, we'll be able to look at everything else in the solar system way out there, including Pluto and Planet Nine, if we ever can find it. In the next picture, I wanna show you that we can also see planets around other stars. Uh, these uh, pictures illustrate a method we've called uh, transiting uh, studies. If a planet uh, goes in front of its star, and block some of the starlight, we see the star blink a little bit. <clears throat> and we see <clears throat> that the amount of light, light blocked by this planet depends on the wavelength. So the, the illustration is showing you uh, three different wavelengths. 
and the planet appears to be a slightly different size according to what wavelength we're observing. And that's because of the chemistry of the atmosphere of a planet. Uh, molecules in the atmosphere can absorb starlight on its way to us, and we can tell. So we have a catalog already of several thousand exoplanets like this. Uh, many of them are orbiting around small M-class stars, which are not very much like the sun, uh, but nevertheless have many, many planets. And so we have already plans to observe nine Earth-sized planets, uh, five Neptune-sized planets, and 16 Jupiter-sized planets uh, orbiting these other stars. Are any of them going to be like Earth? Well, perhaps, but probably not. Uh, we will f start the process of finding out. This is a technique which we hope will be even more useful in the future with new telescopes coming. Um, a sign of life would be oxygen. Uh, oxygen is an extremely reactive molecule here on Earth, and it would all disappear in a few thousand years if there were no algae and plants producing it. So we don't think we can see that on these planets, but we certainly anticipate that future astronomers will be trying harder with new equipment uh, to be built yet in the so to wrap up, I want to show you the equipment that we are providing for astronomers to use. Um, the Webb telescope is so incredibly powerful that if you were a bumblebee and you would hover at the distance of the moon, we would be able to see you in two ways, uh, both by the reflected sunlight and the heat that you would emit. So we have a collection of four instruments on board the Webb telescope, uh, cameras and spectrometers to cover the entire range from 0.6 microns out to 28 microns, visible light that you could see out to wavelengths that you definitely could not. This collection of instruments includes uh, a very powerful spectrometer for studying other galaxies, and it can choose up to 100 galaxies to observe at one time, very powerful. We have three different versions of coronagraphs, which are devices that we use to look for planets orbiting around uh, other stars, by blocking out the light of the star itself. And so we have many powerful tools that were designed knowing that we could not know the scientific questions in advance well enough to just pin it down. So we have a very general purpose instrument package. If you're an astronomer, uh, then you perhaps already submitted a proposal to use this observatory using these particular instruments. We will be uh, requesting additional proposals each year uh, for new ideas about what to look at. In any case, even if you did not propose, we will be making the data available to the public through the Space Telescope Science Institute, which will be operating the observatory for us. By the way, this is a time to thank the observatory uh, engineers and technicians and managers who have made this possible. And our international partnership includes not only NASA and Northrop Grumman and various other American companies, but also uh, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, which are all chipping in to make this a real possibility. So uh, we anticipate many, many surprises, many discoveries, and we look forward to sharing them with you as the time comes. In the next chart, we just show you some of the ways you can find us on the internet. Thank you.